The 1997 movie Tower of Terror premiered on ABC's Wonderful World of Disney as the first attempt at creating a successful series of movies based on popular Disney World theme park rides. Walt, all of this one-off business was a waste of time. The real moneymaker didn't land until the franchise of family-friendly adventure films based around Johnny Depp acting like a drunken pirate. They've confirmed that at least some of that onset drunkenness was actually acting. But tonight, we're cozying up to a distinctly 90s mystery fantasy movie that I realize now planted the seeds for a lot of my current interests. Old Hollywood, paranormal horror movies, and roomy grunge era accessories that make me look as petite and youthful as a teenaged Kirsten Dunst. Only I was never forced to kiss Tom Cruise on camera. That was strictly voluntary for me, baby. Let's explore the ghosts and the curse of the Hollywood Tower Hotel in another scary Disney installment of Clip Breakdown. Hello television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another installment of Clip Breakdown. This is the playlist where we dive into our favorite nostalgic movies, TV movies, and other content on the web, and we dismantle it like a broken elevator to look at each rusty little bit and say, that's okay to keep looking at, and that one is older than I remembered and doesn't entertain me the same way. And mama, today I'm so excited because I have such distinct memories of this movie from when I was growing up. Also. Tower of Terror when I was going to Disney World as a kid on vacation was the ride that I was most excited about and the one that I have the strongest feelings for. Because what is It's a Small World after all? Just swamp water and little kids? I can get that anywhere else in Florida. But before we get into this Kirsten Dunst vehicle, well I guess it was more of a Steve Gutenberg vehicle. Ooh. Make sure you give this video a big thumbs up if you want to see even more clip breakdowns from ABC's Wonderful World of Disney, which is pre-Disney Channel original movies. And also so if you're new here or if you've been watching for a while but haven't yet, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right down here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week. So turn on notifications and you'll always be the first to know when we're going up on a Tuesday with another haunted elevator full of content. Also, I've got merch available and a Patreon where you can access exclusive content every week, such as live watch parties and extra episodes. But mama, sweetie, baby, let me take you back in time to 1930 to the golden era of Hollywood. Black people couldn't get work, women had no rights, and were only allowed to be the script supervisors, and everyone loved it. Disney clearly chooses to ignore the less savory parts of the 1930s, you know, like World War II and all of that. But let's get into it. There's a party to have. Get into the Great Gatsby out of it all. This is a five-star hotel. Can you tell your bellhop not to flail around like a life-size marionette? If my Chanel number no. five is shattered when King Friday here gets my bag upstairs, I swear to God, I'm gonna pull the fire alarm. They're setting the scene at this party and right away, all of these memories come flooding back to me watching this movie. I must have been seven or eight when I first saw this. That's how I know they did a great job at making this not too scary, even though it deals with ghosts. Otherwise, I would not have been able to sit through it. I could not watch Are You Afraid of the Dark, Goosebumps, anything like that. That freaked me out. That was live footage of a 30 year old gay and a 21 year old gay entering the bar. It's amazing how quickly you go from feeling like Shirley Temple to full on Miss Trunchbull. That little girl is the child star that's at the center of this story. She's played by the girl who played the younger sister on Boy Meets World, clearly inspired by Shirley Temple. <laughs> Oof, sweetie, can you step behind that rose bush again? Show business is not ready for a brunette child actor yet. You're more of like the factory worker type. Probably this Disney movie review is not the forum to get super into it, but Hollywood, even back as far as this time, was rampant with child abuse, both in terms of violating labor laws, making kids sit on a block of ice in a little sound booth when they were misbehaving, to working incredibly long hours, drugging them. And of course, sexual assault was rampant because it was an an open secret that there were child abusers running Hollywood. So I didn't have all of that context when I watched this as a child. Anyway, we see this little child actress named Sally and her nanny along with the bellhop and two other people get onto an elevator, but we get some other shots mixed in that let us know there's a magical spell book at work and we're gonna get some drama mama. <laughs> Thank you. 
Damn it, now little Sally's gonna be late for the bikini contest that all the studio executives are judging upstairs. Also, don't try to soften this horrifying instance of mechanical failure with the music from a Nabisco commercial. Tips ahoy! That's a jazz standard called Sing Sing Sing, but if you grew up watching television, it will always be the Chips Ahoy song. I talk about cookies a lot, specifically Chips Ahoy. They're just so good. Me and my sister at the beginning of quarantine got a Chips Ahoy McFlurry that was at McDonald's, and we talk about it to this day. <laughs> it's crazy. Anyway, I do remember that sense of suspense from when I was watching this as a kid. It was really effective, and even rewatching it now as an adult, I was like, Okay, something crazy is happening on this elevator. I don't know what, but they give you that build up with the jazz music, which keeps us in the time frame. So overall, I really love the filmmaking techniques of this movie. It reminds me a ton of like, Don't Look Under the Bed, which we've reviewed here, and So Weird, another show from the late 90s that we've reviewed here. Tower of Terror was written and directed by DJ McHale, who was a writer and director for Are You Afraid of the Dark and Flight 29 Down, which are like other teen dramas, I guess you could say, young people dramas. I remember the show Ghost Rider. He also worked on that. So he knew what he was doing. And I think that my problems, if any, with this script come later in the movie when it's just like, okay, we're really glossing over how they understand some of this information. Like a lot of the mysticism and magic is fully unexplained, which you can usually expect in these movies. It's like, you don't need to know why the magic or the ghosts exist. They just do. So all of the people in the elevator are destroyed by that green lightning. We love to see it. And then we flash forward to present day 1997 when we see our main character Buzzy he's like a reporter who uses his niece to stage photographs for his articles about ghosts and aliens and other spooky things that are all completely fictionalized in a National Enquirer type tabloid. Kirsten Dunst plays his niece Anna or Anna, Anna, I guess I'm probably gonna say, <laughs> who loves helping him, but is always curious if it's true, the stuff that he writes about. Is any of it true? Aside from sports and obits, most legit papers are just as bogus. Truth doesn't count. Selling papers counts. Hmm, I never thought of it like that. Hey, can I see your journalism degree one more time? It kind of looked like it was written on the back of a Denny's kids venue. I would say that most stories in legit newspapers are not bogus because they have journalists working on them and they have to verify the facts as part of their job. And those like National Enquirer magazines and stuff, they're sold along with newspapers where it's like Bat Boy found in cave. But if you look at how they're actually categorized under the publication listing, they're satire. I needed someone to point that out to me as a kid because I was like, Mom, they found Jesus's sandals in a desert, and if you touch them, your cancer goes away. So anyway, he writes those kind of articles. Almost forgot. For help me out. It's the one, right? Yes! Oh, you're wicked great! It's the metal chain of female desire. Thank you, Uncle. Anna didn't really seem like the jewelry type with her interest in the paranormal, so I don't know why they tried to force the friendship bracelet. I wish it could have been like a book of mysticism or something that provided information later on so that she could have helped provide key parts of the puzzle when they're solving the mystery. Instead, she's just kind of like, you know, she doesn't help that much. The bracelet could be used like as a better device, I think. Also, I sent some New England writers. I grew up being like, wicked cool. That was wicked awesome, wicked great. So when I hear an actor say that in a movie, especially one that takes place in LA, I'm like, I don't think they said that on the West Coast as much. Maybe they did in the 90s. Let me know. So Uncle Buzzy goes to the National Banner or whatever the name of the head newspaper is in town to sell the story of his alien encounter. Of course, the newspaper rejects this, but there's also some unspoken history between Buzzy and Jill, the lady who runs the paper. Remember that crummy little seafood place in Malibu where the fish kind of tastes like shoes? Maybe. You and I could go back there. You want to go back to a place with bad fish? See, this is why we broke up in the first place. Our relationship was always between me, you, and the intestinal worms that you love so much. Your parasite fetish was kind of hot at first, but then my hair started to get so brittle. It's such a cliche for like the main character to meet with some female character and it's like, remember we went on a date all those years ago? Like with Owen and Claire in the Jurassic World movies. How's your mother doing? My mother died about 10 years ago, Mr. Galvan. I think I just let a ghost in your apartment. Do I come into your house while you're at the doctor and try to repair your CPAP machine? No, because I'm not authorized. I also wonder if this woman that we're about to meet, Abigail, lied about being the mother, or if this guy just assumes that every old lady is someone's mom and lets them into the house. Like, that's not a neighborly thing. If I saw some old lady hanging around my neighbor's house, I would push her down the stairs. I'm not trying to get porch pirates stealing my Amazon packages. I have read all of your work. <laughs> Her insight into the supernatural is very impressive. 
she? She's trying to get in touch with the ghost of the third class passenger who f***ed her on the Titanic. His name was Jack. He was last seen being a popsicle. I'm not saying the elderly shouldn't be allowed to get a bus pass. I'm just saying that someone's got to keep an eye on murder she wrote here before she ghostbusters her ass onto a milk carton. Chasing down reporters who write about ghosts. She's lucky someone hasn't already snapped her leg and snatched her purse. What is up with me and this elder abuse? I blame you, Disney. I have the corpse of Walt Disney sitting right here. I hope you're ready for some more context and historical info about the accident at the Tower Hotel. Does this building look familiar? Yes, that's the ride at Disney World that made my sister piss her pants. Do you have a fast pass? Or is this your way of telling me that you need to use the bathroom? I wanna stop guessing, but this exposition is taking all day. By the way, IMDB says that they use the actual Tower of Terror ride from Disney World in Florida for the exteriors and interiors of this movie. Now that picture was definitely the actual ride, but I can't imagine they shot interiors in there because it doesn't look like what I remember from that ride at all. It looks much bigger. And why would they shut down a ride that has like turnstiles and cues in it when they could just easily reconstruct that? So I think that might've just been made up, but we'll see. Halloween night, 1939. Five people disappeared mysteriously from the elevator, including Sally Shine, child movie star. Made little Sally a legend. Well, that's Hollywood for you. The only thing more lovable than a child star is a dead child star. It's called the Jean Bonnet Ramsey effect, and it's the reason I perm my hair and ask strangers for rides home. This is getting dark. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Not sorry. So Sally Shine, the little girl, was Abigail's supposed best friend in the world. That's what she tells Buzzy here. And she's desperate to find out what happens, but she has key information about what mysteriously happened that night. Because of her, Emmeline Partridge, she was so Sally Shine's nanny. <laughs> Looks like a real witch. I mean, she looks like a lady holding an umbrella. If you're ugly, make sure you smile around Buzzy over here or he'll burn you at the stake. Also, did Emmeline only wear one plaid suit? Because this looks like a production photo from her costume fitting. Like she took that picture in character. She was like, okay, it's 1939. We're taking this photo of you. Mm. Like she went into a photo studio just to shake her umbrella angrily at that cameraman. <laughs> Abigail was actually that brunette headed girl who was witnessing everything in the old time days. So she tells us what she saw. Because I saw from her book of souls, she summoned the black powers of the underworld to curse poor Sally. She couldn't control it. It swallowed her along with Sally and the other innocent people on that elevator. Excuse me, you saw that she couldn't control the magic? You weren't even on the elevator, Blanche. Besides, if you're so observant, how come the DMV won't let you drive anymore? Your eyes are soft grapes, mama, and your brain is melted brie. When Buzzy tries to deny her story, she gets really irate and she's like, I've been f holding this secret for years because of how it traumatized me. She needs him to go into that Hollywood Tower Hotel, which has been abandoned since the accident, which to me is the most fictional part of this story. Capitalism says if five people die in your hotel, we're still open for business the next day, okay? Money's gonna money, no matter what. But in this world, they were like, ooh, we better shut it down because someone got murdered. Children got kidnapped all the time. It was just part of being alive. So she wants Buzzy to go get the book. The hotel has been empty since then, but her book of souls must still be there. Why don't you go get it? I, I couldn't go back there. The memories are just too painful. Well, then you must not want your dead friend's book that bad, huh, lady? We've all got painful elevator memories, okay? Actually, wait, no. It was an escalator that I killed that guy on. Just get out of my way when Cinnabon releases a new seasonal flavor. She's telling me that over 58 years, she did not work up the courage to sneak into this Hollywood Tower Hotel, snag that book, and I don't even know what it is she's trying to do. Oh, right. She says that the dark magic has trapped Sally's soul there along with all of those innocent people, and they need to get the book to prove it, and then that will, like, be the biggest story and it's gonna you know bring her all this peace and this is your chance I'm giving you a big story already I would be like wait lady what do you want me to do this for like how does this help you if I find you this book and I publish the story about the dark magic I'm gonna sound crazy no matter what but apparently he feels this is the legitimizing story he needs to get out of the occult area where he writes for the Inquirer like it sounds like that's just another ghost story that's gonna sound just as made up as everything else you've written but okay so while he's walking around around the Hollywood Tower Hotel, you can really see that that's probably the actual grounds of the ride at Florida. Um, it just seems like they've tried to cover up a lot of, you know, standing areas, modern day railings and things like that. So the, he meets the guy who owns the hotel right now. It's 
like the groundskeeper. And he was also related to somebody who was on that elevator that night. My grandpa was Dewey Todd. The bellhop who disappeared that night? Um, so you mean suspect number one? He was the only person on that elevator who worked at the hotel. Also, and I say this with the utmost carelessness, he looks kind of like a sex criminal. This guy points out that he's the last living relative of anyone who owns the hotel, and he's not allowed to open it again until after the mystery is solved. That's what his grandpa would have wanted, I guess. I think it's something like the bellhop's father, the great grandfather of this guy owns the hotel and therefore never let Dewey, the bellhop, have any responsibilities because he didn't think he was responsible enough. Anyway, this groundskeeper guy is motivated to solve the mystery because that means he's gonna get rich when the hotel can open back up. And I'm just like, who's gonna stop you from opening it back up? Your dead grandfather? Because it said so in his will. He can't leave you the hotel and tell you not to open it. It's your land, baby. And judging by that wide shot, this is a hotel <laughs> weirdly at the base and somehow taller than the Hollywood Hills with the Hollywood sign. They would be getting amazing rates. Okay, so then there's lots of scenes where he's like looking with a flashlight down the hallways and around the interior. It's very possible that this is actually from the Disney ride itself, these interiors. Again, I don't know why they would do it. It just seems like it would be more cramped than they need to shoot, but let me know. Maybe I'm wrong. The ghost said anyone under 21 gets an X on their hand. Or I guess they're just fine with casual violence. That could have slightly hurt his hand. Also, another trick with the editing that I've noticed in these kids horror movies is they don't edit it so that it's scary at all. Not only are we seeing that pen fall really slowly and it's kind of broadcast with the POV shot ahead of it, but also just the pacing, the amount of cuts they show really prevent it from being a jump scare. It shows his hand lifting off of the table and then it cuts to a medium shot of him turning the page and then the uh, back to the close up of where his hand was and the pen falling. So it doesn't actually feel like uh, in a subconscious level like it was that close of a call because we saw his hand have time to get over here. If it was more one after the other, like he was like, then it would be like, ooh, that was so close. It's a really subtle difference, but these are just like the editing techniques I've noticed they use that probably help this feel a lot less like a horror movie. And the reason why I didn't run screaming, screaming and fuming when um, I watched this as a baby boy. As Buzzy is exploring the mansion, we know for a fact that there's paranormal happenings. That's me checking to see if the noise I just heard was my Postmates getting dropped off. But then when I realize it wasn't, I get paranoid that my neighbors all saw me. So I just pretend to be like checking the weather. I'm like, oh, oh yeah, sky cloud. Also, we only had like three CGI effects throughout the 90s. It was walking through a mirror, flying on green screen, or making things appear and disappear with magical fairy dust. Now it's all of that, plus like a big monstrous dragon coming out of the water, a big beam of fiery light in the sky. We still have lots of CGI cliches. So Buzzy finds the Book of Souls, and as they're looking at it, he's reading through these crazy spells. He's like, this stuff is so kooky. This is gonna be a great story. And he convinces his sister to let Anna help him. It's a cool story that people care about, and it could get Uncle Buzz back into a real newspaper. Sis, he's never gonna get a job at a real newspaper just from working at a fictional tabloid. From his previous conversations with you, it sounds like he doesn't even know how to cite his sources using the MLA format. He's trying to use Anna to dress up like a young Sally Shine so that he can, like, put a picture in with the story that illustrates the ghost. And the sister's like, didn't you want a real story? And he's like, yeah, well, it's just an illustration. It's art. And I'm like, yeah, I actually get that. That makes sense. Not something you'd put in the real newspaper though. Start a website. He's just a few years ahead of the dot-com boom when he can make a killing. Get a domain name right when they start becoming a thing. You'll have the SEO footprint to have the biggest paranormal research website within all of California. So Buzzy and Anna are getting dressed in their costume and Buzzy hired some other actress to be the nanny to play Emmeline Partridge. So this is where we meet this actress who I remember very clearly now. I'm Claire, Claire Poulet. Poulet? That's chicken in French. <laughs> okay, why don't you let me know what your last name is and I can tell you how it tastes like dirt in my mouth. Buzzy is clearly taken with Claire, but he's also like, oh, I can't really use you for the shoot. It's just, you're too young. Miss Partridge, she's an old witch. Another two job, two 
Too young, too old, too skinny, too fat, too everything but what you need. Wow, you are not mentally prepared to be an actress, are you? That's correct. You're too all of those things for some roles. But when we need someone to play Jan from The Office or the dad's girlfriend in the Hannah Montana movie, you're going to get the first call, sweets. That is Melora Hardin of The Office fame, who we did see in the Hannah Montana movie. I know we had a lot of Office fans sounding off about that in the last movie, so I wanted to call her out. She has another bad accent in this one, my love. So while Claire is outside getting ready for the shoot, Anna and Buzzy start to investigate some mysterious noises, and they have their first paranormal encounter at the hotel. Dance and sing a little faster, sweetheart. It's cool that you rented the rain machine, but this down-tempo nonsense is not how you win the pageant. This was the part of Disney's Tower of Terror ride that was too scary for me as a kid. It's like the cart would start to go forward and down a hallway, and then that appears at the end and she starts singing. It was scary. But I think it's really cool that they really emulated certain visuals from the ride right into the movie. This is something they did, like making movies based on the rides a few times over. They did it with The Haunted mansion pirates of the caribbean obviously i guess tomorrowland counts as one of those oh they also did it for mission to mars the country bears and there you go anyway buzzy and anna are still getting scared <laughs> That dead body rolling out on its own that fast like that is still freaky to me to this day. And I'm not a little kid anymore. I've seen dead bodies. In fact, I volunteer to be the pallbearer at every funeral I go to just because it gets you a little extra attention. It to be in a couple more photos, maybe the newspaper. Ooh, brand recognition. Anyway, sorry for your loss. So Anna and Buzzy run out and they're like, oh my God, there's really ghosts, there's really ghosts. We're gonna get Jill from the banner down here and she's gonna see all of this proof and I'm gonna get my job at the banner because I just discovered real ghosts. So he runs and tells Jill and he's like, I've got the biggest story you've ever heard of. Buzzy, why does it always have to be about the biggest story of your life? Why can't it just be about the truth? This is the truth. That's what you said five years ago. But my monthly herpes outbreaks indicate otherwise. That's the subtext. That, that line was cut. For some reason, ABC couldn't approve that one. But after he leaves, um, Jill is at least passingly curious about Abigail. I need you to do a background check for me on an Abigail Gregory. Journalism, making phone calls, writing a name down on a piece of paper. This is how you win that Pulitzer. So back at home, we get more exposition from Anna about what they have to do next, I guess. Miss Partridge used black magic to banish Sally to the underworld for an eternity of pain. Okay, and exactly which part of the Florida panhandle do they refer to as the underworld? ABC said it's too religious and inappropriate to use the word hell, so let's just describe a land of eternal damnation and pain and the church kids will get it. She, I guess, describes that because the spell failed, it didn't cast them to the underworld. It only allowed them to be stuck in the hotel forever and only on that night, Halloween night, do they have an opportunity to break the curse and allow them to move on to the the afterlife. But they need to collect a few things in order to do this. Well, tell me this is Sally Shine's hair. Yeah. You mean my best friend who I lost as a child? Yes, thank you for being so sensitive. Like, I know this is all an episode of Goosebumps for you, Gutenberg, but people died in an elevator. Have some respect for their dead, bloody, electrocuted corpses. They basically need to have an object from each of the people on the elevator in order to do the spell and break the curse. Hmm, what's this? E.P. Emmeline Partridge. Mm. Mama, why are you picking up these 58-year-old artifacts and rubbing them on your face like a Charmin commercial? Just let the sad lady talk and enjoy the fragrance of her YSL opium perfume. It's not hard. Also, I forget if I was able to mention it or not, but this is actually a Halloween movie. Be because the day that the elevator thing happened was Halloween and also Sally Shine's birthday. Ooh. Abigail's kind of explaining the ritual that needs to happen when they go back on Halloween night to break the curse. So like a seance, huh? Uh, no, a conjuring. 
She is the blueprint. Come on now. So the next day, they're at the hotel. The groundskeeper has Dewey's hat that I don't know how he has, since it seems like that's the hat he was wearing when he got exploded by lightning. But maybe he had two. This is a little formulaic where they have to collect all of the pieces, you know, in order to do the ritual. Did the same exact thing in Stephen King's It, actually, written just a few years before this. So Buzzy's grabbing some pictures of Claire, who's doing her best to look old in this outfit. This is my first job. Well, second, the first one didn't really work out. Yeah, well, you kept eating handfuls of lettuce while you were making people Subway sandwiches. You never mentioned that part. The one role you're really good at playing is the victim, lady. God, we hired you to take some pictures. This isn't your application for nutritional assistance. Meanwhile, Claire goes into the house and starts snooping around, so we know something's gonna happen there. While Buzzy and Claire get a little bit closer and we learn more about Buzzy's backstory. Through what? More exposition. Wrote for the banner. Then a guy came to me with a hot story. He had a video tape. Showed the mayor taking a bribe from the mob. It was the biggest story to hit LA in years and it was all mine. Turns out the video was a fake. The banner dumped the blame on me and kicked me out. Wait, so you, the journalist, got fired for writing an untrue and damaging article based on unverified evidence? You know what? You two actually deserve each other. She blames Hollywood for her failed acting career when apparently she just takes a dump in her auditions. And for him, it's the newspaper's fault that he never learned what libel is. The real horror story here is the unaccredited art schools that sent both of you out into the workforce. So while streaming around, Anna's able to look through the guest ledger and find the guy, the man in the tuck and gets his glasses. So they're finding all of the clues they need. While outside, Claire gets disappointed with Buzzy's motivations. Proof of ghosts? We're talking history! I thought that you wanted to help the ghosts. What, with some bogus voodoo? Okay, I think you might be over compartmentalizing the headless body with a butcher knife that recently scared you. How come you're fully prepared to expose the existence of PG ghosts, but the existence of a magical spell book is somehow too far-fetched for you? That's like me denying the existence of straight people, even though I've seen that type of intercourse on the internet. And can I just say, if you think that's what nature intended, then you people need to take that shit back out to the forest and the desert plains, because not in my house. While she's snooping, Anna gets harassed by some ghosty ghosts. I'm here to help you. If anyone needs help, it's you. <laughs> Checking in. You're a bad girl. When you say you're into kink on Grinder and then realize in person you're in over your head. I'd show up dressed like Babette from Beauty and the Beast like, oh, I had a different idea of what this would be. After a brief commercial break, we get continued frightful scares, but less scary because the adrenaline is no longer through us because we watched, you know, a commercial for Airheads Extreme. <laughs> You wanna help us? Can you fix the elevator? We have to get to the party. Damn, you wear a plaid shirt one time and Shirley Temple thinks you're the superintendent. I don't work here, it's the 90s, you foggy ass, cloudy ass little Get into the grunge of it all. I'm really protective of young Kirsten Dunst because I loved her in Jumanji. Meanwhile, Jill is visiting Abigail's nursing home to be like, I wanna visit Abigail and bring her a birthday present since, hey, I just found out it's her birthday and I can ask her some more questions. So I'm like, this is the type of journalism that Buzzy should be doing. Buzzy hears an interesting story from a mysterious old lady who admits to maybe murdering someone years ago and he runs into the nearest abandoned building to take pictures of fake ghosts. Meanwhile, Jill here is like, let me do a background check, let me follow up on this lady, maybe there's something here after all. And she's exactly right. This just shows Buzzy's an idiot. But back at the hotel, we meet all the ghosts. Both Steve Gutenberg is there now and Anna, so everyone's like all together learning everything. Carolyn Crossan is my real name. My stage name is Claire Poulet. Maybe I'm not such a bad actress after all. Yeah, because that hybrid New Jersey slash Southern accent is really consistent. I admonished her Tennessee accent as well in Hannah Montana the movie. I guess I really am just better than her. More talented, more superior, a greater uh, friend to society. That was just a joke, people. Also, wouldn't the magazines at the time have reported on all five of the people who went missing in the elevator? Like Buzzy had never seen or heard of anyone outside of the bellhop, the child star and her nanny? That sounds like the setup to a joke. A child, a nanny, and a bellhop walk into an elevator where they're immediately struck by lightning and burned to death. The wonderful world of Disney. While talking to the manager of this nursing home that Abigail lives at, Jill uncovers some new info about Abigail and her connection to Sally. Abigail was Sally Shine's sister. Oh, 
I sort of forgot that we didn't already know that. And I'm not sure if it's because I saw this movie as a child or if it's just that predictable. But also I think it's because those character archetypes are kind of what were set up by whatever happened to baby Jane. So I just kind of like assumed they were sisters and the unfamous one was jealous. I don't know how I knew it. I need a vitamin. Oh, look. Mm. So now that we've met the whole cast of the five elevator ghosts, we get a feel for what their lives are like here in this old hotel. Cheers. That's the same technique I use for maintaining balanced hydration. For every sip of liquid I take in, I immediately release an equal amount of urine. That reminds me, Siri, order more super absorbent panty liners. That's when Emmeline Partridge arrives and we think that she's the witch who wanted to kill Sally. So our girl Anna gets right up in her business about it. It was you, you no, old witch. No, 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 don't take him off. We know all about your black magic. You cast a spell on Sally because you hated her, but it backfired and you all got zapped. We saw you on the roof with your gunman. I'm not the one who stabbed the captain with the pickle. But right off the bat, we get a feeling that that might not be the full truth because Emmeline seems to be really caring of the young girl. I couldn't love Sally more if she were my own daughter. Emmeline wouldn't hurt Sally. Oh, of course not. She's a crusty old dame, but she loves the girl. I love how this lady just has glasses and an umbrella and like isn't always smiling and they're like, this crusty ass wench with the snaggle tooth soul over here. Damn 1930s, you really hated women. And 1990s, I guess too. Also, I remember this section of dialogue from the movie so clearly that it's like having deja vu. It's so weird how I can remember watching this moment of the movie specifically in my Nana's upstairs apartment. Movies are so crazy, like the audio of it will just take you right back and you'll be like, I guess I never truly forgot that. So Jill back in Abigail's room discovers a major secret. That's my future employer when they discover the hours of content I've published about some random guy named Shane Dawson. Also, that 80-year-old woman could fit all of her secret materials into the lid of one hope chest. I'm not even half her age, and that secret compartment wouldn't even hold all of the equipment I use for my enemas. People who grew up during the Depression really did know how to get by with less. Older gay millennials need a two-car garage just to store all of their obsolete pornography DVDs. So Jill's realizing, and now we as the audience are also realizing that Abigail Gail is actually not so smart and she never liked Sally. Her own sister she hated and wanted her to die. And she's been harboring all of this jealousy for years. This is where I start to not get what's going on. I'll explain more as we go. <laughs> That's how I picture my Nana watching down on me from heaven while I get fingered on a dance floor to Lady Gaga. Also, that's legit how old people wait outside for the Starbucks to open so they can get their small hot coffee at 5 a.m. Like, calm down, Eileen. Calm down, Eileen. By the way, my Nana, whose upstairs apartment that I watched this movie in, she's the one who's watching me from heaven, getting fingered. And also, her name's Eileen. <gasps> That's a disgusting triangle. She would be so proud. <laughs> so the nursing home manager's like, oh, we didn't know she was crazy, crazy. We would not be letting her out of the house or whatever. I never she would have said, released her had oh. I known any of this. And this is very, give me those, give me those. I'm gonna deny everything. And if you tell anybody about this, I'll have you arrested for trespassing. So it's the word of a leading newspaper journalist against that of a sleazy nursing home manager. How are you gonna deny those broken collarbones and wrist bruises that appear on your residence every time the Jets lose a game? Meanwhile, this is like, we're in the third act now just about, and it's just like dumping all of the info on you. Stuck on 11, one floor short. If we could just get to the party, the curse would be broken. Damn, all these rules. Did someone get a letter from the government of the underworld when you all died? When was this all explained? And not to be rude, but usually when people get struck by lightning, they just shut the f up. Somehow they know that if they get up to the 12th floor on Halloween night before the party is over, the curse will be broken. Again, I guess they just know this from being there for 60 years and hearing the party. Party never ended. Hear it every Halloween. We tried the stairs, but we can't get past 11. It's like a 
curse. Yeah, it's already been described as a curse several times, you fancy little man, looking like Bubbles the Chimpanzee. In the 1930s, someone could slap the glasses off that guy's face and it wouldn't be a crime. Then at 8.05, the party ends until the next year, it's torture. Staying out at a party until 8.05 does sound like torture. Here's what I do, show up early, then around seven o'clock, I pretend to get a phone call telling me that my daughter's been kidnapped from daycare, then I book it. Then I just never talk to anyone there again. So Buzzy, who I apparently want some of that ghost He's like, no, Claire, I'm gonna help you. I really care about you guys. So we're gonna break the curse, get you guys up to the 12th floor before 8.05 and you guys are gonna go to heaven, yay. So it's Halloween night and they're getting ready to go do the thing. But then Jill comes over and she's like, Buzzy, you were right. I found this big, huge news scoop that, you know, she's crazy. She killed Sally Shiner. This is the whole story now. So come write this with me. So he basically wants to ditch his niece to go do that. You said you were gonna help them, but you lied. I guess the truth doesn't matter to you. <gasps> it's a pointless bracelet from the beginning of the movie. I swear, your screenplay could win an Oscar if you show the same piece of jewelry at the right two places. And it's not because that's good writing. I think most of the Academy is just old boomers who are still impressed by the same screenwriting techniques from the silent film era. What's white and bougie? Giving jewelry? Perfect. I think they could have given this a lot more texture that would actually include Kirsten Dunst in the movie more. Like, if she's super into the occult and she loves that book that Buzzy got her in my version of the script and the other kids at school are like, whatever, that's not true. You're such a freak. And then he's like, I'm sorry, I have to go write this newspaper because this is all about me trying to get back my job. And then she's like, fine, well, I'm gonna do it myself. But then he overhears like kids making fun of her and being like, whatever, we told you, you couldn't really find ghosts. And then she could look at him and be like, see, I guess the truth really doesn't matter. And then she throws the book or the bracelet down. That would be a cute way to kind of up the ante and up the pressure on him to be like, oh, I gotta do the right thing. But instead he goes and starts writing in the newspaper. Meanwhile, we know Abigail is in full force trying to do her plan now. What she really needed was all of these little artifacts so that she could finish the spell and cast those five ghosts to the underworld only on Halloween night. So it's a big problem. <laughs> white gaze after choosing a shade of bleach blonde to dye their hair for the summer. So while the rest of the gang is at the Hollywood Tower Hotel and waiting to do the little journey, Buzzy is back at the newspaper office and he starts to think, hmm, how did Abigail know all of that specific stuff about the dark magic? She was so specific about knowing the book existed. It wouldn't make sense that she would even know what happened on the elevator. So at least they caught that plot hole much later than it should have taken him to realize it as an investigative journalist. So then he realizes, oh my God, it's her plan to finish the spell somehow. I don't really know how he makes that connection. So he ditches on the newspaper with the lady, runs to the hotel. Meanwhile, happening there. <laughs> What happened to this lady not being able to enter the hotel because of the painful memory? Now she's up in here with her Babadook robe running rampant. Like if she can actually go back into the building, then why did she even tip off a journalist about this mystery or the existence of that book or the need for all of these little items altogether? She could have just gone in there and gotten them at any point over the last 58 years and done this. Also, how did she even know to complete the curse? If her whole plan was to make her sister disappear, she did that and then the hotel shut down. She would never know that there were ghosts versions of the girl running around the hotel. Like she would be happy with having successfully murdered her sister. So like sending the ghost sister to the underworld wouldn't really be necessary to completing her plan in the first place. But anyway, she's off doing the spell in her full evil wizard look. Strike them down one and all and cast their souls into the underworld of eternal misery. At this point, you could curse people a lot faster if you would just be okay with saying the word hell. I mean, you're about to kill your sister's ghost with an elevator, why are you watching your language? Also, here's how I know Abigail is a full-blown psychopath. She first murdered her sister as a child back in 1939 by somehow learning to master dark magic as an eight-year-old. And then when her sister's disappearance made her legend even more famous, that drove her crazier, and she decided that the way of fixing that would be to send the legend or the ghost of that sister to hell, even though the rest of the world wouldn't even know that that's happening. Why all the drama, grandmama? Can't you just die of heart failure already? Like, this is so much. 
team too much. But remember, this is a trick. So because the team thinks that they have all of the items that they need and the spell, they get on the elevator on Halloween night thinking, oh, we're this is gonna finally take us up to the party, when really Abigail's planning it for taking them down to the underworld. So right as Anna realizes this, she runs onto the elevator to stop them, and somehow Sally Shine runs off. Like, I don't know why Anna even bothered to get on that rickety old elevator, shouldn't have. But now we've got that old swippy switch, so Anna's in trouble. History's about to repeat itself. My niece is going along for the ride. What a clever way to describe the industrial accident that's about to kill your sister's daughter. When does the adult feel like calling 911 on the lady in the abandoned building messing around with all the electronics? So anyway, the whole team is running around now. We're getting there, kids. Hey, wait! <laughs> Something tells me the little girl who plays Sally was in the middle of a spelling test with her tutor or something, because this back of the head performance screams body double to me. So they catch Abigail all together while Anna and the ghosts are stuck in the elevator. Don't understand, nobody understand. Eesh. Abigail's nursing home really needed to step it up with the elderly mental health awareness. Maybe go ahead and send a wellness survey to any of the remaining residents who haven't stopped eating yet. Here Abigail says, you don't understand, the ghost of my sister has been haunting me for so long. And it's like, yeah, but not the literal ghost, right? Just the memory of it. This is not gonna help with that. You gotta go to therapy. But then Sally comes over and makes an appearance and we love that. Who's that? Do you know my sister? She was like the brunette, talentless version of me who was always peering around a corner. She had a sad, homely face, just like yours. Buzzy is like, Sally, tell us how you feel about your sister. I tell her, I'm sorry for not getting to her birthday party. My birth, my birth. It was a surprise. I didn't know, I, d I didn't know. Yeah, but does one would-be birthday party really make up for a lifetime of favoritism? I would be no help in this situation, like zap little Bo Peep to hell. Also, it seems like Sally got a lot of the hate from Abigail for something that was really her parents' neglect. They are the ones who were focusing on the child star for the money, and I just don't get it. In life, were these little girls close or not? Sally is like, oh, she was my best friend. Meanwhile, Abigail is sharpening a battle ax and carving a voodoo doll. She's up in art class being like, hanam shaba, hanam shaba, and everyone's like, oh, those kids love each other. Sally must be clueless, but Abigail's heart is softened now that she knows, oh, they were gonna have a birthday party for me upstairs and I just was so jealous for no reason. She was my best friend. Abby didn't care that I was a star. Huh. Girl, she cared an ultra lot. It caused her to kill you and four other innocent people. These girls are just not super observant about one another's feelings. Are we sure they're both displaying and interpreting social cues properly? Let's feed them both barbiturates, just in case. What, it's 1939 to them. Buzzy remembers something from the spell book that they hope can help prevent this curse from happening. Cause at this point, Abigail, again, can't control her stupid magic. A spell of passion can only be counted by its contrary. What is the contrary to this spell? I, I don't know. No. Suddenly, she doesn't have all the answers. Who is in charge of the flow of information with all of these magical rules and standards? Was magic created to be helpful or is it more like an uncontrollable natural force like the weather? That sounds like a 1 a.m. conversation I would be having at the smoking area of my former rehab center. Oh, to be 15 again. So the gang gets in the service elevator, try to race the elevator to the top floor. They run up to the 11th floor, which is as high as it will go, which is also where the ghost elevator is stuck so that they can try to get Anna over to the safe side. uncomfortable energy in here. Not sure if it's because Abigail trapped Sally for 58 years in a waking hell, or if that young girl is just trying to find her mark on the floor. Looks like that. We have to go through this whole adventure where Anna has to jump across the two elevators to get to the safe side with her uncle. And then right as the clock strikes 8.05, the big thing happens. This is what we call the money shot. Come buy those theme park tickets, people. There's been a 5% price increase. They accomplished these shots of the interior of the elevator using miniatures. I could tell because there's a miniature artist in the credits and you just kind of can see like it makes sense for that shot. But as those elevators are falling, our two girls like make up and Sally had this bracelet on her wrist that was going to be the present that she gave to Abigail at the party.
damn, double homicide. And all it took to break the curse was the two Shiner sisters getting vaporized by an atomic blast. Cold War dreaming of a ghost. So then the humans are able to safely exit the elevators. The ghost, the ghost, the ghost. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Sally's love for Abigail broke the spell. Thank you for adding in that line so my seven-year-old niece can understand what's going on without asking me a question for two minutes. I don't have a seven-year-old niece, but if I ever do, someone better tag her on this video so she knows I've got beef. Claire Poulet is like, thank you so much for helping us, whatever that accent is. Come with us to the party. Don't you get it, little girl? You're dead. You're all dead. You died years ago and you're never coming back. All of your parents, all of your friends, they're dead. You should be screaming. Ah! But because the curse is broken, we're able to finally hit the party. Jazzy, 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 cigarette girls and syphilis brain, racial discrimination in World War II. What a great time frame to cut a rug. We got so many happy endings here, more than we actually even probably needed. Will you be my bride? I literally thought these two didn't even like each other. Also, why does the earthly construct of marriage even matter in the afterlife? And I don't want to hear any Bible answers. It's just kind of cliche that every woman needs to be paired with a man by the end of the movie. Like, come on, even in Ghost Town? Even Jill and Buzzy kiss again, so like, they're back together. And our ghost girls meet once more. Abby? Thank you for the present. I love it. Happy birthday, Abby. All right, have fun in heaven. I guess we'll just figure out what to do with the old lady corpse that you left behind in the elevator. This is gonna look a lot like one of those elaborate life insurance scams that I keep getting arrested for. Meanwhile, Dewey's great grandson or whatever is like, we solved the mystery. Cha-ching. The hotel is open back for business. <laughs> Um, you are wearing that dress, little mama, and that is the happily ever after that Walt Disney would have wanted. Also, congrats to this teenager for getting concrete evidence of the existence of ghosts and an afterlife at such a young age. I'm sure that's not gonna f you up. I would be doing heroin by the next day. But anyway, that's all we wrote for The Tower of Terror. Do you guys remember this movie from your childhood? Did it make an impression on you like it did on me? I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Also, give this video a big thumbs up if you want to see even more clip breakdowns from ABC's wonderful world of Disney. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right down here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week, so turn on notifications and you'll always be the first to know when there's an elevator crashing on your dead buddy. Also, I've got merch available and a Patreon where you can access monthly bonus content and exclusive watch parties. I just put an episode of Toy Commercial Commentary up, so you're going to want to check that out if you're a fan of those series from the past on my channel. You guys are all the greatest. Thank you so much for getting into a rickety elevator with me today. I will see you next time.